Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, along with our daughter Jennifer. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Mm -hmm. Now, I have an announcement. Every six weeks, approximately every six weeks, we have a new rotation in our online prophetic school. Now, our online prophetic school has been available for several years now, and we've had between 1,500 and 2,000 people that have taken uh, one or more of our courses intended to activate the voice of God in your life. Currently, we have in five courses. Each one of these courses is six weeks long. It's done online, so there's flexibility about hours and times. And each lesson has a video, a downloadable PDF that you can print out. And then we have online forums where you interact with other interns because we're not just going to tell you. We're going to give you opportunity to put into practice what you learn week by week. The whole point is to activate you so you know you hear the voice of God and have the courage and fluency in the gift of God to share what you hear for your benefit and for the benefit of others. Course one is a beginning course. And if you've ever never taken a course in the prophetic and the, the nine gifts of the spirit, this is your starting place. Course number two is about propagating the prophetic. It's taking what you have learned and applying it in real world situations with family, friends, on the job, with total strangers. Uh, we walk you through the boldness of just stepping out and using the gifts that we've given you and taught you in the safe learning environment of the online school. Then course number three is moving a little bit deeper into advanced prophetic gifting. If you're one of those people that you would describe yourself as being prophetic or maybe your friends would describe you as being prophetic, then this is a school for you. Uh, the scripture teaches in Romans 7 about motivational gifts. and These are personality templates that are brought by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And one of those personality templates or motivational gifts, as some call them, is the gift of the prophetic. And we can help you with that. It's all about how to plug in to the purposes of God through prophetic gifting. And then course number four is prophetic office. Uh, have you ever considered if maybe you were called to the office of a prophet? <laughs> Most people would say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> and uh, You want to go there? But no, the fact of the matter is that just like God calls people to be pastors, God calls people to be prophets. Amen. Just like he calls people to be evangelists, he calls people Amen. to be prophets. And we're here to help you with that. And even if you know you're not called to the office of a prophet, how about knowing how to relate to uh, how to support, how to engage and understand the prophets in your midst. This course will help you with that. So it's not just for people who think you might be called. That's course number four. And then course number five is prophetic counseling. God told us to do prophetic counseling years and years ago, and it was not unknown at that time. Uh, you'd hear that a lot, but whenever I researched and tried to just find some information on what others were doing, and I saw the term used, but I never saw any instruction or even a definition as to what prophetic counseling was. And we have counseled with thousands of people around the world. We've had phone calls from the jungles of Manila. Mm -hmm. We've counseled people in leadership in the military, in government, in the medical field, the business field, all the way down just everyday folks. And uh, many times it's just dealing with issues in their life. Sometimes it's been dealing with life and death issues. Amen. And if you have a prophetic gifting that's an operation of your in your life and you want to be able to move in prophetic counseling, this is the only course I know of that makes that available. And it's very powerful. And how do you find out about these courses? Now, they're beginning this week. And again, it's, it's online, so it doesn't operate on some hard schedule that you have to show up. Next week. Uh, is it next week? It's the first of the week. 18th. So it's coming up. It's, it's the 18th. The 18th. Mm -hmm. And so you want to, uh, it has some flexibility. 
uh, you're able to fit it into how your day runs and your week runs to, to glean from the videos, the printed matter, and maybe you or somebody you know, you want to take these courses. We ja we've actually brought the cost down by a third than what we've charged all this time. That's right. And because we want to make them accessible. And for those of you that are really in a crunch, we have uh, installments that you can make on a weekly basis just to make it easy for you. And how do you find out about them? Two ways. Go to propheticnow.com or go to propheticinternship.com. If you go to propheticnow.com, you're going to see a graphic up front and center about the prophetic school, and there's a listing. Now, it used to be that we would require anyone taking the course. You had to take course number one, two, three in that order. But the Lord told me, he said, let the people qualify themselves. There's some people that come that have years of experience in the prophetic, but they want some of the information here that they know will help them. And so we're going to let you decide where you start. And, and you click on the link for the prophetic school and you'll read all the course descriptions and then you get to choose. And then there's also uh, links if you just want to start at the beginning and go through the whole thing. We have some special pricing for that. So now's the time for you. We have room in the classes. We have a certain number of people we like to see in each class. It's not unlimited. And so now's the time to get signed up before we are. We have to close the number, close the each class for the six-week rotation in order to keep the course manageable and accessible for everybody. Propheticnow.com or propheticinternship.com is where you would go to sign up. Now, we're studying in Isaiah chapter 2. And how many of you have been going over to swordministries.org? Best way I know to tell you how to do that is on Facebook. They have a page. Because as soon as we get done with our teaching here, we're getting in the car, going across town, and participating in the 10 Days of Glory Amen. conference with Apostle Warren Hunter and his beautiful wife, Kayla, and Amen. the ministry team there. And uh, this is day six. We've been teaching on seven days of God's process and this is day six and we're concluding day seven if you go to sword ministries dot org tomorrow is the conclusion if you go to sword ministries on facebook you'll actually see all the videos of the night sessions and the morning sessions as well today we're teaching in isaiah chapter two in that day is today that day in chapter 2 of Isaiah, the prophet describes a people who have idols in their heart in the midst of prosperity and peace in the land. And You know, having idols in your heart, there's a verse, I believe it's found in Jeremiah, that says when the people have idols in their heart, that he would cause the prophet to prophesy to the people according to the idols in their heart, and then he would destroy both the people and that prophet. Mm. And so that's one thing when you're in the prophetic and you're speaking into like we and here's a perfect example. A lady wrote in, she said, please prophesy that my husband will drop dead because he has been unfaithful and he's just gotten right with God and he's being faithful to me now. I want him to die while he's faithful uh, before he goes out and he does this again. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to prophesy that I don't to you. think so. <laughs> Please prophesy that I'll get that brand new Maserati that, uh, or that my parents will buy me a new car and give me a new house to live in. Well, what is that? That's prophesying according to the idols that are in people's hearts and it gets much more subtle than that and it requires discernment when you live in a culture where uh, idolatry and sometimes just uh, subliminal idolatry even among people that are very religious in their culture under the rule of Yuza and Jotham when Isaiah first began prophesying there was relatively relative peace in the southern kingdom Rather than uh, being thankful, the people became decadent in their culture. And while outwardly devout, they maintained secret groves and hidden pagan altars. Mm -hmm. These things abounded even in Jerusalem itself. Isaiah declares that the day of the Lord is going to come. And in that day, the idols would be utterly abolished. Now, as believers in Jesus, anytime we read the Old Testament, we ask ourselves, what did this tell me about my walk in the kingdom in my relationship with Jesus. It's an exhortation to us to identify the idols in our hearts and deal with them. Now, rather than suffering unnecessary consequences 
in that day, at any given point in your life, you're walking out an envelope of time, a segment of time. Things have beginnings and they have endings. And there are times that you can be under the indulgence of God and the patience of God and the tolerance of God. But he said his spirit won't always strive with man, not because he doesn't love you, but because he does. Mm -hmm. If you have a two or three year old baby and he wants his uh, uh, chocolate bar and you don't give it to him and he throws himself on the floor and he bucks and he kicks and he turns blue. Uh, you're gonna you're you're going to have an envelope of time where at first it's kind of cute and then he kind of goes on doing it and you're getting a little patient and then all of a sudden you realize that patience really isn't what the child needs the child needs some discipline the scripture says that if we're without discipline in Hebrews that we're a member of an orphaned generation and the King James Bible says then we're bastards and not sons we want to walk out our sonship. And part of that is what Isaiah addresses. So let's begin Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, please. Okay. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the last day, I'm sorry, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, thy, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures, their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols, they worship the work of their own hands, and that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. Now you notice in verse 5 where Isaiah is addressing <laughs> the house of Jacob in the prophets, where the scripture addresses the house of Jacob, and then it, it might be the house of Israel. We interpret that Jacob was who Israel was before he wrestled with the Lord. It's talking about unregenerate humanity. It's talking about that part of us that is not acting out of who you are in Christ, but acting out of who you are in the natural, what Paul identified as the man of sin. And so when it says house of Jacob, he's appealing to that part of us to whom the cross has yet to have been applied due to a need for collaboration, cooperation on our part with what God's doing or saying. He's appealing to that part of us that is our own worst enemy. O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. God is light. And he's called us to be light in the Lord. He's, let us walk in his person. Let us walk in his nature. Now, verse 1 is very interesting, and I always look for the technical information in these uh, chapters. It says, uh, uh, "It's let me turn to it." It right says here. that this is the word that the son of Amos saw. So he didn't say it's what he heard. It didn't say it's what he sensed. You ever somebody prophesies to you, they're going to say one of three things usually. Mm -hmm. They'll say, "This is what I see God saying to you," or they'll say, "This is what I hear the Lord saying." Or they'll say, this is what I sense God is saying to you, because you look to see, listen to hear, sense to feel. There are many ways to hear from God, but those are three primary means. So the prophetic gifting of Isaiah, he was a seer, at least in the beginning. In the prophetic, you, you look to see, listen to hear, sense to feel. One of these modalities of hearing from God will be more fundamental to you than others. In the Old Testament period, seeing was more common, so much so that before Samuel's time, 
1 Samuel 9, 9 tells us that all prophets were called seers. This tells us that with Samuel, things began to change in terms of prophetic gifting, that uh, it was a gifting that came upon Samuel that caused none of his words to fall to the ground. Amen. That's a level of the prophetic where you're not saying it because it's going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen because you're saying it. Amen. And that's a level of the prophetic that if you have the prophetic office on your life, you're going to go in and out. Of that level. That's a, a level of the prophetic that you're going to step into. We teach in our prophetic course seven levels of the prophetic. And when you take our course number four on prophetic office, we will walk you through and release to you the unction to experience all seven levels of prophetic office. And you're going to learn some of those are going to be more prominent in your life. If you understand what came on Samuel, you'll realize that it was necessary for Samuel to lay hands on Saul and then later to lay hands upon David because the Christ anointing first rested upon Samuel and then he imparted it as the anointing to be king initially upon Saul and then later on when he laid hands on David, it said the spirit that came on Saul by the laying on of hands of Samuel left Saul and departed and went to David. And then it was released from David throughout his bloodline right down to Jesus in his bloodline after the natural. Amen. And uh, it's very interesting how that, that gifting, that mantle moved to Samuel and threw him even right down to Jesus. See, with Samuel, things began to change in terms of prophetic gifting. Samuel was a special kind of prophet. He led God's people out of the chaotic times of the judges and was used to ordain David, again, who was a type of Christ and the progenitor of Jesus, through the lines of Joseph and Mary. Uh, as the first prophet to anoint any king, Samuel was also a forerunner of John the Baptist, who was used to inaugurate Jesus into his ministry in Galilee. And this is a signs and wonders ministry. Mm -hmm. The scripture says John the Baptist did no miracle, but Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't do any miracles until John the Baptist laid hands on him. He did not make Jesus who he was, mm -hmm. but he activated by laying on of hands. When he laid hands on him and baptized him, Amen. he activated that Christ anointed in him. Thank you, Lord. In verse 2 of our chapter, Isaiah gives a comprehensive eschatological overview of the purposes of God from his standpoint, Isaiah's standpoint, six centuries before Christ, right down to our day and beyond. Whatever the events of history, the mountain of the Lord's house, what Isaiah said in verse 2, namely the kingdom of God is going to rule over the affairs of men and all nations are going to flow into it. What's happening in the earth? The mountain of the Lord's house is being established and all nations are flowing into it. That's not something that's going to happen one day. That's something that has been happening since the very day God looked out upon the deep and saw the darkness and said, light be, right down to our day. It's God's cosmic plan, his macro plan, his plan at the macro level, and it's his plan at the micro level in the very intimate details of your life. This statement, it's interesting, of Isaiah is quoted verbatim by the prophet Micah. Who was the prophet Micah? Well, he was a running buddy of Isaiah, and they both prophesied the same thing. Now, if two prophets prophesied the same thing today, and they both posted it on their Facebook group, uh, somebody's going to get accused of plagiarism. Mm -hmm. But Micah 4.1, it says, he quotes exactly from Isaiah. He said, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all people will flow into it. Now, the question might come, is Isaiah plagiarizing Micah, or is Micah plagiarizing Isaiah? Neither would be the same, be, seem to be the case in view of the fact that both statements by two independent prophets, contemporary to one another, are equally included in the canon of Scripture. It doesn't always happen, but when the prophets agree, 
And this emphatically highlights and underscores it, what God is saying through them, even if one or the other prophetic voice lifted the statement from another. Whatever you may believe about the things of God or the outlaying of end time events, the end result ultimately is a unified manifestation of the kingdom of God over all the earth. Now, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a statement uh, you can hear in, the, in uh, Catholic doctrine. It says the kingdom has come, the kingdom is come, and the kingdom is coming. And that is a statement worthy of expectation of accept, acceptance. The kingdom has come, the kingdom is come, and the kingdom is coming. So it isn't just something that's going to happen one day. What the kingdom is doing, it has done. What the kingdom has done, it is doing, both at the macro level, on the cosmic level, the global level, but also intimately in your life. And it's also what is on the horizon, not just something that will come one day, it is what God was doing 2,600 years ago in Isaiah's time, and it's what God is doing now, not only among nations, but in your own heart and life. There are many mountains. How many say, you know, we know all those songs. Got any mountains you think are impossible? Well, are we going over the mountain, or is the mountain flowing into the kingdom that's on the inside of us? Amen. We're not going to yield to the mountain. The mountain's going to yield to the Amen. kingdom of God on the inside of us, and it's going to flow into us and go from being a resistance to being a resource Amen. because that's the nature of the kingdom of God. That's Your father right. has this problem. He thinks he's God. He never runs from a fight. He takes the fight, and he, he subdues it, and he brings it to heel at his feet, and then he takes that resistance and turns it into a resource for his people, and that's what he's doing in the earth, and that's why he's doing in history, and that's what he's doing on the inside of you. Remember that Jesus declared in Luke 17, 21, that the kingdom of God is in you. So we're talking about the mountain of the Lord's house. That's something that is on the inside of you. In fact, the, in the same verse, he describes the kingdom not as something you go looking for, in terms of manifestation beyond you, but something that is installed, dynamic, and vital on the inside of you. God's purpose in Christ is to cause all nations to flow into the mountain of the Lord's house. And from Jesus' perspective, they wanted to hear about the cosmic plan. They were pulling out their Clarence Larkin charts and what they were expecting to happen in, through God's linear purpose through time. He was saying, no, it's on the inside of you. Whatever the kingdom is, we can have a lot of else. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom this, <laughs> kingdom that, and Clarence Larkin, and C.I. <coughs> Schofield, and pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pan-trib. The kingdom, for goodness all sake. All that stuff. <laughs> when you talk to Jesus about that, he just wanted to talk about what was on the end. For him, it was all encapsulated, whatever he had in mind. He says, this: what you're looking for in terms of of an eschatological timeline, he said, it's on the inside of you. Amen. Now, when you preach this, uh, you get people saying, you're not going to take my mansion. I'm going to have my cabin over in the corner of glory land. You're not God. And look, we're not trying to take, <laughs> we're not listening to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. We're not trying to take anything from you. But when Jesus told the disciples, he said, every one of you is going to betray me, John 12. And he said, but fear not. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, not where I will be, but he was saying where I am. Well, where was he? He was spiritually located with the Father. I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. And by the time I go to the cross and come out of the grave on the third day, I'm going to make it possible for you to live in this earth where I am with the Father, so much so that he went on to say that the works that I do shall you do and do greater, not because of what's coming, but because of what's on the inside of you. Woohoo! Amen. Who's with me? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> see, God's purpose, see, that's why when you prophesy, how many times have I been provoked to prophesy? You have nations in you. Mm, it's because that's the Micah 1, 4 truth, the Isaiah 2, 2 truth, that the nations of the earth are flowing into the kingdom that's on the inside of you. Amen. That's good, huh? See, that from Jesus' perspective, that kingdom is as much in you, if not more so, than it is anywhere else. 
Isaiah goes on to describe an era of tremendous peace and prosperity. Punctuating this description with the exhortation to the people, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Look how good you got it. What else could possibly go right? See, that's a foreshadowing of what Paul preached. These people actually need to do some repenting. And so Isaiah is hammering down on the goodness of God. He's not dangling them over the fires of hell on a wet noodle. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't accountable. He's not ignoring. Oh, you pillow prophet. I've heard those Leonard Ravenhill types that talk like that. But let me tell you something. There's a different ways to get people to repent. And if you look at what the scripture says, even in the Old Covenant, the way when repentance was deeply needed, the goodness of God was heavily emphasized, according to Romans 2, 4, and 5, that it is the goodness of God. Do you have a rascal that needs to repent? in your life, go give them God's goodness. Amen. If God's goodness won't turn them, then they're reprobate to the faith and it's not possible for them to repent. Amen. Because there are people who will not turn at God's goodness, but many times you can put them under enough pressure and they will turn because of negative circumstances, but that is not a true repentance. And jailhouses are full of jailhouse converts that Amen. can testify by how they conduct themselves when they get out to the fact that that kind of repentance is not genuine. No, heartfelt. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, Isaiah, he's noting this prosperity that the southern kingdom enjoys under Uzziah and his son Jotham, who was his regent because Uzziah was a leper and he couldn't run the kingdom. And if you want to know more about that, get my book, oh, uh, yeah. Face to Face, face, with, to face the with the Father on Amazon. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to how Uzziah became the leper king. If you haven't purchased the book, you need to go get the book. Because there's so many truths that are prophetically spoken around 20 encounters with God that that um, were had in the scripture. But Russ gets it from God, how to build a story. And the fellow, one of our spiritual prophets said, Russ, if we get to heaven and find out that is not all exactly accurate, I'll be totally shocked. That's how accurate it is. Now, felt. you can get the paperback on Amazon. Now, let's see who's listening. If you are an ebook person and you'd like to read it, in an ebook format, send me an email, russellwalden at gmail.com, and I'll send you the ebook for free. I wanted to give something away today. Praise God. That's what I'm going to give. Praise God. Okay. So, though the land is uh, in prosperity, Isaiah begins to lament in verses 7 through 9. He says, The land is full of silver and gold and horses, but then without breaking his thought, he says, But it's also full of idols. And he, he laments that from the impoverished man, the, lo, the mean man, the man of, of uh, little means, all the way to men of wealth, universally were giving to bowing down and humiliating themselves in the pagan groves and sacred trees that dotted the countryside, even in view of the holy city. Verse 10 through the end of the chapter. Okay. <clears throat> Enter into the rocks and hide thee in the dust for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and upon every one that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan and upon all the mountains all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up and upon every high tower and upon every fenced wall and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be made low and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day and the idols he shall utterly abolish and they shall go down into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the Lord, for the fear of the Lord for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idol, idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they may, which they made for each other one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the cleft of the rock and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils for wherein he is to be accounted of. So we're talking about the day of the Lord uh, when all accounts are settled, when uh, 
Grandpa used to say, the chickens come home to roost. Mm -hmm. My daddy used to say, you know, you think sometimes you get away with something, but my daddy would make a statement. He says, payday doesn't come every Friday, but it does come. Mm -hmm. And I want you to see, when we're in a position where we know that we're stepping into a season of accountability personally, regionally, nationally, or globally, or as a church, what, what do we do? Look at the counsel of Isaiah 10, uh, 2.10. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust. What, who is the rock? Jesus is the rock. He's the rock that followed Moses through the wilderness. He's the rock that we've all been baptized into. When we understand who we are in Christ, and what, what about hiding in the dust? In other words, think about how people... With people in in our society are absolutely enamored with the fantasy of being something more than just dust. The scripture says over and again, I know you, that you're but dust. Dust is some of the most common elements there is. I love the scripture that says, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. And I got to looking at that, and rubies are one of the rarest gems there are, but they're made of one of the most common elements known to the earth. And so it's about humility. It's about knowing, humbling yourself. How low can you? It's the Holy Ghost limbo, folks. <laughs> How low can you go? No. Humility is God's secret weapon. You ever watch Bilbo Baggins when he puts on that cloak of invisibility? Mm -hmm. Then the bad guys are standing right there and they can't see him because mm -hmm. the enemy has no concept. When you begin to move in humility, it's like disappearing. He doesn't know how to track, how to relate somebody acting in humility because he doesn't have any. It's the one spiritual grace the enemy cannot counterfeit. He can corrupt it. He can contaminate it. But he cannot counterfeit it. It's a, it's a secret weapon. It's how many watched Karate Kid? There was that crane move that little scrawny kid used to beat up the guy who was challenging him. It was could not be defended. Well, it's the crane move of the Holy Ghost. When you <laughs> choose to be humble, you're stepping into a a posture uh, that you cannot be defeated because the enemy has no defense. And so we enter into the rock and we hide in the dust and the enemy can't find you. He doesn't know. And think about how we try to be something else. We have all of these stories in uh, on the, the movies and stuff of people that are more than human. They have supernatural abilities. They can leap over buildings with a single bound. There's hardly anything you watch these days on television that's popular that doesn't have these elements of trying to make man more than he is. But that just puts a target on your back. Hide in the dust. Oh, humble. Man. Now, when we talk about humbling yourself, we're not talking about humbling yourself to man. Mm -mm. People say, I thought you were a Christian. And I look at him, I say, not that kind. Mm -hmm. well, what do you mean? Not the kind that adopts a perverted sense of Christian conscience that makes me feel like I have to let somebody run me down in the name of humility. No, you humble yourself to God. Right. You humble yourself to what God says. I am who God says I am. Don't matter what people think of me. You're you're moving according to what God says about you. I'm I'm entering the rock. I am in Christ, but I know what I'm made of. That's how Paul could say, "Receive me, I've wronged no man." When he had <laughs> delivered Christians over to death, but at the same breath say, "I'm the chief of sinners." He was entering into the rock, and he was hiding in the dust. And Amen. we need to do the same thing. Amen. In verse 10, Isaiah is introducing the idea of the day of the Lord, when the glory and the majesty will be made known. Now, the glory is on the inside of you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Philippians 4.19 says he'll meet all your needs out of his riches in glory. And when the glory comes, your God is in your belly. And when the glory comes out of you as a river of water coming out of your belly, then the majesty of God is going to be made known. But that is also a day when the lofty looks of man will be humbled and all haughty spirits will be bowed down. Now, that's not just in general to, to the universal throne of God. That'll happen in your life personally. I've had God put me in a position where he had people that were abjectly my enemy, people that lived. I had a fellow that stood in his pulpit and for years announced that his primary, one of his primary goals in building his church was to destroy the life and ministry of Russ Walden. It's a long story behind that, but there came a day he called me up and he wanted me to come see him because he was in trouble. 
and uh, I was driving over there, and the Lord says, I've delivered your enemy into your hand. What are you going to do with him? Well, I, I entered into the rock, and I hid in the dust. I said, I'm going to love him. And the Lord said, just check him. And we've had people with their lofty looks and their haughty uh, opinions who were just dead set against us. And then finally, after the God in us manifested in glory and majesty, they came back around and said, well, if God's not mad at you, I can't be mad at you. What was happening? Thank you. Haughty looks and and lofty the lofty looks of men, the haughty spirits, they're bowing down. Not to us, mm-hmm. but to what God was doing. Did you ever get mad at what God was doing in somebody else's life? you got to understand, what are you mad at? Are you mad at them and their humanity? Or are you mad at the God who's doing something in their life you wish you'd do in your life? The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. What should be our response? We can look around. We can see the astonishing arrogance of man. At every point in our culture and society, we see contradictions to the character of the scriptures and the commandment of God. You quote the scripture. I've seen it. I've seen it on so-called secular news organizations that claim to be the we're the news broadcasters supporting God and country. But you start quoting scripture and they're backpedaling as fast as they can because they don't want to own up to the scriptures. They think they know better than the scripture. They think the scriptures were just some archaic verbiage that came out of the Bronze Age that doesn't apply in a sophisticated society. As a people of God, we should be astonished at the conceit of men that somehow think they know better than what God says. It should be our determination to humble ourselves. You're never going to talk them into it. Humble ourselves. Now, rather than waiting to be humbled by inevitable calamities that are coming upon a nation so divorced in their hearts from the least unto the greatest of them, from fidelity and honor of the living God. To humble ourselves, it's more than just an expression of humility. In the previous chapter, we saw that the people, though they were very idolatrous in chapter 1, they were nonetheless very religious. They were very active in outward displays of love for Jehovah and honor for his temple. Mm -hmm. He said, who's required you, God told him, to tread my courts? Think about that. Can you imagine the pastor walking up to somebody saying, you know, hey, who asked you to come to church today? <laughs> I didn't ask you. It's like God, God's questioning that. Well, isn't this what you want us to do, God? Now, when we talk about that, that, that they were coming to a temple there in the city of Jerusalem. Where is the temple in our lives? Where is the temple of God on the inside of us? It's aren't we the temple? Aren't we the temple of God? Mm-hmm. See, humility is a heart issue. It's a matter of holding ourself personally accountable without anyone looking on to the mandates of Scripture and the commandments of God's holy law. See, we think we're being pious and godly when we're denouncing the transgressions of others. But somebody who's walking in true piety will rarely talk about what's going on in somebody else's life. They're too busy, as my father would put it, holding their own feet to the fire. Mm-hmm. I've had people come around and ask, try and get me to form an opinion about what somebody else was doing. And many times I would say, excuse me, I don't think you know who you're talking to. I am un- in no position to form an opinion about somebody else's walk with God. I'm trying to, like the scripture says, cleanse my hands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Sanctify your own self. Amen. <laughs> See, to the degree we level blame, we are establishing our own guilt. And I found that people that are pointing fingers, it's because something that's on the inside of them that needs to be addressed. And you need, when that's working on the inside of you, you have to say, this is pointing at a secret sin, something that's so deep in my character that maybe I can't even identify it. Begin to ask God to show it to you, to grant to you what was denied Esau. Esau sought a place of repentance and couldn't find it, though he sought it carefully with tears. God, give me the gift of repentance. Amen. See, in the day we live in, individualism has become so universal that even in matters of faith, the highest ethic seems to be to each his own without any unified, arbitrary, or objective standard of integrity or holiness before God. We're quick to accuse others 
and equally adept at excusing ourselves. I mean, I know people that are deeply pious that weep at the altar on a regular basis, and they have, and they absolutely eschew evil, and they will separate themselves from those that have any nuance of what they consider to be spiritual contamination or lack of integrity, but they have such glaring uh, inconsistencies in their life, the areas that they're, they're glossing over and completely ignoring, that it's astonishing the level of their, of their conceit, and yet they're just seemingly incapable. They're, they're very gifted and bringing and addressing the nuance of disobedience in others, but they absolutely ignore the gargantuan contradictions in their own life and lifestyle. Quick to accuse others. What's the solution? Make the choice of humility. Humility and holding, listen, holding ourselves. The fact of the matter is that most of us would not allow somebody else to hold us accountable. Somebody comes up to you today, hey, I'm going to hold you accountable. Come here, you come here and sit down. We'd laugh in their face. If your pastor came up to you, hey, I'm uh, going to hold you accountable. You get in my office. You, you just call the work and you tell them you won't be at work all week long. I'm going to spend a week and I want you to come sit and I'm going to make you accountable. Most of us wouldn't put up with that. There was a movement uh, back in the 1970s that was all about accountability and authority. Not, not to a prophet or an apostle, mm -hmm. to a pastor, uh, a, an office that is universally accepted in the body of Christ. And uh, the leader of that movement, he said, I used to be an angel till the backbiters gnawed my wings off because he said one word, authority. Mm -hmm. And we proved the inability to exercise godly authority and certainly proved the inability to submit to godly authority. And so what, what's, does that, we just say, okay, anything goes. And quite honestly, that's what the body of Christ has done. That's it. We're not going to get into that. That doesn't work. Let's just forget the whole thing. Each his own. What's right for you is right for you. And that's the end of the matter. No, we have to come back. If we can't get people to be accountable to God ordained authority in their midst, then we have to teach people how to live out this Christian life on their own recognizance. Mm -hmm. I may not be, I may, there may be a scripture uh, that is uh, kind of one of those difficult passages, and maybe it is at my place to hold you accountable to that. And even if it was, would you let me? But I could certainly say we can't extract that verse from the scripture. We can't pretend that verse doesn't belong there. You have to decide what that verse means to you in your life. And if that's as close as we can get, then we need to work from there. Walking in accountability. Uh, that's what the ed is the implementation of humbling ourselves because if we don't walk in accountability, we will be called into account. Just because we don't accept accountability structures or apply uh, a standard of holding ourselves accountable to a standard of holiness in the scripture, that doesn't mean we're not accountable. That's right. Verse 17 goes on to tell us that there's going to come a day that the loftiness of man, every departure of man from that which is consistent with the mind of God is going to be bowed down and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Now that's not only an ultimate day that will arrive for all men. In that day can be a very personal day of reckoning. When, as they say, again, the chickens come home to roost. What is there, ask yourself, what is there taking place in your life that you are allowing and overlooking that will become an astonishment and a scandal before God in the day he calls you into account. This is more than something that happens after death. This could be today or tomorrow for you. To humble yourself now rather than waiting to be humbled mm -hmm. by circumstance and situation. And it's not humbling yourself according to the prescription of man. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of people in David's day that uh, had an idea of what he should have done after the affair with Bathsheba. Well, he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And when he talked about this in Psalm 51, he said, Lord, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Well, tell that to Ahitophel, Bathsheba's daddy. You tell you mess with my little girl, let me tell you something, it's on. I've counted bail money in my pocket more than once. I took my pistol and I gave it to a friend of mine. I said, you need to keep this until my daughter is no longer dating because he didn't make very good dating choices and I didn't trust myself. And Ahitophel got so mad at David that he committed suicide. 
rather than put up with uh, being a part of David's administration. There was a man named uh, Shimei. When David was leaving the city after Absalom ran him out of town, came out throwing rocks at David. This is because of what you did with uh, uh, Bathsheba and, and Uriah and was throwing, had all these ideas of what needed to happen uh, to David. And David's friends wanted to go over there and take his head off. And David said, no, maybe God has bidden him to say such things. Leave him alone. But he still didn't do what Shimei wanted him to do. He humbled himself to God Amen. and not to man. Mm -hmm. We need to find out what that's like. It's that transaction that comes between you and God because you're capable of a moment of conviction. And so few Christians actually repent. I know of so few examples of Christian repentance. And there's only one that really stands out since I've been a pastor of it. You know, we get, we repent to become Christians and we hate it so bad that we never do it again. And I knew one man who stood up, been in the ministry his whole life. And I was a young pastor and he was in his 60s, which to me was very ancient at that time. And he got up and he repented of a very personal sin with his family and, and his grandchildren and his wife in the uh, congregation. And man, it was a holy moment. It was like one of the most astonishing moments I've ever experienced as a pastor. And you don't want to draw your next breath. It's holy ground. You want to Amen. take off your shoes. I'll Amen. never forget it. Uh, but I've seen that reoccur. So uh, too often you have, if, if someone feels convicted, they just want to pick up another scripture like a spitball and hurl it at the first person that reminds them that maybe they ought to be doing something different. See, what is it? What's going on on the inside of you? Verse 18 declares that the idols in that day will be utterly abolished. Now, so here's where we start. Okay, Brother Walden, I'm willing to be willing. It's like that. I love that song. I want to be born again again. Okay, let's identify our idols. They must be identified because we may have so integrated idols into our life, into the bedrock of our thinking, that we're incapable of distinguishing them. This was the case in the family to whom John wrote in 1 John 5.21. 1 John 5.21, John was writing to a church that most pastors would give their eye teeth to be pastoring. This is one, other than the church at Ephesus, the church that John wrote the three letters to, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, was probably one of the most esteemed, spiritual, mature congregations there was. And here, the last thing he says to them, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, I know good and well that those folks were not going out bowing down to an idol. That house church was very devout. It was unthinkable that anyone in this family would actually be frequenting the brothel slash temples of the city bowing down to a stone or a piece of wood. So what is idolatry? Idolatry is looking outwardly for what we should be finding inwardly in our dependence upon Christ. Idolatry proposes the dwelling place of God to be anywhere other than the heart of man. Amen. I tell you, it, something inside me trembles. When you go into a church, shh, this is the house of God. Hello? <laughs> now I know what they're getting at, but it's, it's like when I was pastoring. Let me give you an example. Watching the time. When I was pastoring, I had several deacons that I'd inherited in the church, and they had a tobacco habit, and they'd come in reeking of uh, tobacco and just so it, it, it full of guilt and shame. And they wouldn't dare light up in the church, and you know. But we, but I'd go pick up the butts during the week that they'd toss outside by the church door in the grass, and, and we'd get in the presence of God, and I, I would say, look. Uh, whatsoever is uh, not of faith is sin. You think you, you would never come in here and light that cigarette in this congregation, but yet you are the temple of God. You are, God says, you are, Jesus didn't die for this building. He shed blood for what's on the inside of you, but yet you defile that temple every day. I say, I don't have a problem with your cigarette. Can I astonish you? I think there's a whole lot more about gluttony, overeating, judgment, gossip, and everything else going on in the church. I think cigarettes are not top of God's list. It's not good for you. 
But I don't think that's at the top. But so many people living in shame. I told him, I said, look, I don't care about your cigarette. I care about you having a clean conscience. Amen. You are the temple of God. Amen. And if you can smoke that cigarette with a clean conscience, I'll get off the pulpit in the middle of the worship with God's spirit raining down and I'll light your Marlboro. Because if it and doesn't, put if, and put there. ashtrays in your seat, and I would have done it too. I was a young man. I had a little zeal back then. That, <laughs> maybe not according to wisdom. <laughs> but it, you are the temple Amen. of God. See, idolatry is looking outwardly for what we should be looking inwardly. Idolatry proposes the dwelling place of God to be inward, anywhere other than the heart of man. In the Old Testament, worshiping anywhere than the temple was dealt with on pain of death. For us, in the New Covenant, we know we are the temple. Christ dwells in our heart by faith. He is our dependence. Any outward dependence in search of the security or fulfillment is idolatry. Yeah. I feel good about myself because I look like Rock Hudson and I have a full head of hair. And I have a fat bank account, drive a nice car and live in a palatial house and all my bills are paid. Hmm. It's not wrong to have any of those things. But if that's your security, then that is a manifestation of idolatry. That's right. It's outward dependence. It's looking to anything or anyone for what we ought to be looking to the Lord for. Amen. Oh, I don't feel good about myself unless I got this trophy wife sitting here by me doing this broadcast. No. It's you get your sense of self referral, your sense of well being, not in the fact. So many people, you want to see how what it is? They would pass their children through the fire to Chemosh. Jesus. Your kids are out there doing their best and they blow it and you say, Where did I go wrong? And then if they're brain surgeons, look, I, your heart gets all puffed up. You, you scandalize your children. You brutalize your children with expectations, not only dealing with their own uh, insecurity and sense of self, but they have to carry the burden of your own sense of success rather than looking to Jesus for who he says you are. You're demanding your children become that for you. And we wonder sometimes why our kids can't wait to get out of the house. They'll go out and torpedo their own lives just in, to get out from under the brutality of the idolatrous expectations of their parents. See, let him be your dependence. Idolatry is any outward dependence on people, circumstances, or things that, that we look to to buttress our sense of self rather than anchoring our self-referral, like Colossians 3 says, set your affections, and that word means emotional attenuation. Set your affections on things above not on things of earth, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Any outward dependence or sense of security or fulfillment, that's idolatry. So let's begin it. Let's just ask the Father, Father, help us to tear down our idols, whatever and whoever they might be. I know Kitty and I, when we met and we dated, we fell in love so deeply that God uh, broke us up. And we went through nine months of, of not seeing each other while we had to figure out who Lord, who the Lord was. Amen. And not loving one another with a love that crossed the boundary of God's Lordship and the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's right. And when we figured that out, then the Lord get, made it possible for us to be together and ultimately get married. Amen. Dealing with idolatry Thank in you, your heart. That we might lean with our whole heart upon Christ alone. Mm -hmm. So that in that day, when the day of humiliation comes, we're already humble. Yep, I know this environment. <laughs> yep, I know I know the floor pitch. Down the hall, there's the bathroom down there. Bathroom represents repentance Amen. in a dream. Uh, we we got it all figured out. It's we're not we're not falling. Pride goes before a fall. But it, when the day of humiliation, when that day comes, when the day of reckoning comes, uh, I know this territory. We're at ground zero. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, baby. Let loose because I know who my source is and Amen. you're going to navigate right on through it while everybody else is breathing like a worm in hot ashes, but mm -hmm. you have found the posture of humility because you dealt with the idols in your heart. Glory to God. Thank you, Father, that you remind us that our body is the temple. It's the place where you chose to dwell and you thought about us before the foundations of the world, just like Jesus. And you saw we had a good outcome and you began then to draw us back to yourself. We, our prayer is that we could grow up into the full stature of Jesus 
so we could uh, not be told apart when people walk down the street. And, Excuse me, I think I just felt Jesus. I got to go back and talk to that person. Or I, excuse me, I just smelled the rose of Sharon. I got to go check it, check that out. That when people would inquire, inquire of the hope that we have, they would find Jesus full and overflowing from our vessels. We pray that and bless our family and our friends, Father, in morning light. In Jesus' name, amen.